Hello, my name is Jess Adamson. Welcome to the Breakthrough Podcast, brought to you by Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation, Australia's only dedicated mental health research organisation. In this series, we'll be talking to courageous people who share their personal stories about their lived experience of mental health issues. We'll also be talking to researchers in the field to get an understanding of the how and why of mental illness. Mental illness is going to be the biggest health challenge in our lifetime. It consumes lives, it ruins lives, it takes lives. But it's time the question was answered. Why does it happen? And more importantly, how can we stop it? If you find anything spoken about in today's episode distressing, please contact Mental Health Emergency on 131465. John Mannion is the Executive Director of Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation and has worked in the mental health arena for more than 30 years, first in his native UK, but also managing mental health services in South Australia. His passion and dedication for reducing the stigma of mental health and raising much needed funds to support research is unmistakable. Well, John Mannion and Professor Steve Wessling, welcome to our first Breakthrough podcast. John, I want to start by asking you to paint a picture for us. What does mental health look like in Australia today? Thanks for inviting us, Jess. Um, mental health in Australia is the same as it is everywhere else in the world. It's complex. Um, we know that um, one in five people will be experiencing a mental health challenge um, in their lifetime. That was pre-COVID. Now that COVID's arrived. We know then that those figures and the impacts are probably going to increase. In fact, I think some of the latest research coming out of Sydney University has said that, you know, we may see a change in some of our suicide rates and we may see an increase up to about 20%. So we need to be mindful mm. what impact that would be. But we also know that, you know, that, that from a presentation perspective, you know, 45% of all presentations, uh, first signs of, of challenges occur before the age of 16. Um, and we know that that sits at about 75% by the time we hit 24. So we know that our interventions and our strategies we want to put in place, the earlier we can do that, we've actually really got to focus on this younger cohort. Um, biggest challenges that we face is the fact that, you know, we know that eight Australians today will lose their battle with their mental health challenges and will die of suicide. Um, and if the, the sort of 35 others um, will, will contemplate suicide as a way to sort of escape the trauma they're actually experiencing. So we know that's a big battle for us because that's eight too many. In fact, one is one too many. Mm. Um, so a lot of the work we're now wanting to look at really is, is how do we actually get people to be able to connect? How do we get people to engage? How do we get that early intervention taking place? But also how do we battle some of the stigma that's still there? Because if we've got eight people really struggling and not knowing how to reach out, then there's got to be a block of why that's taking place. Um, so we know that you know the mental health conversation has been really, is really, really strong now. Um, but how do we translate that into people listening? How do we translate that into actions? And then how do we translate it into way in which people can actually reach out and get the sort of treatment that's individual to themselves because every one of us is individual um, but also that it's a way in which they can actually feel supported and, and guided on that journey. Mm. Early intervention as you mentioned and research are key and as Breakthrough's executive director that's something that you're particularly passionate about isn't it? Yeah yeah I mean I think the challenge of what we've often faced is, is you know, what's the best intervention to put into place for somebody? Um, I think Pat McGorry identified that, you know, that 60% uh, of all interventions at the moment don't really have any evidence to prove they work, yet we carry on doing them. Um, and so if we want to drive change, if we want to improve on those outcomes for people, then we've really got to have clear evidence to look at what we're doing. Any other part of business, if something wasn't working and you carried on doing expecting a change, I think that's the definition of stupidity, isn't it? Where we need to be looking at that same concept within our mental health arena, especially then getting the sort of really clear evidence and research to actually support that. Um, we know, though, that the earlier interventions actually have better outcomes for people. We don't want people to get to that crisis point where they actually really need, you know, our, our clinical services if we can actually put support mechanisms in place earlier. Um, so really, uh, we established breakthrough to really tackle that question. How do we get good evidence? How do we support great research? How do we support the best researchers to give good outcomes for Australians? Professor Steve Westling is the inaugural Executive Director of the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, SAMRI. Professor Westling is an infectious diseases physician and researcher in neurovirology, HIV and vaccine development and was the former Dean of the Faculty of Medicine, Nursing and Health Services at Monash University from 2007 to 2011. 
SAMRI is home to more than 800 researchers, students and partners working together to tackle society's biggest health challenges. Steve, no one knows um, how important research is like you do. How critical is it in this area of mental health? Yeah, so I very much believe that research is the answer to mental health. But I also know and observe how good we are at cancer research and cardiovascular research. You know, we now cure a number of cancers. We treat other cancers really well. The rate of cardiac disease has gone down dramatically, but none of that has happened in mental health. And so our we understand so little about mental health, yet we understand so much about so many other problems in in people's health. And so I'm really motivated by the idea that if we can get the research to understand mental health as well as we understand cancer or heart disease, then we'll have some of the answers that we've been looking for and we'll know which 60% of interventions are the right ones and which ones are the wrong ones. And um, so th- there is so much to do and so few of the questions around mental health have been answered. So it's a really exciting area for researchers, but also, you know, very worrying to us that we have been unable to answer those questions up until now. Mm. It is exciting, as you mentioned. What's the research telling us so far and what areas um, do we need to focus on first? Well, I I think the research is telling us that mental health uh, is an issue, a lifelong issue, and that we can intervene early. And so if we start thinking about mental health from the time of conception, really, through to the attachment to the mother, through to, through adolescence, into uh, your early 20s, and then um, through your middle age and later life. So it's, it's a lifelong issue. And we're understanding that interventions need to occur um, very early to optimise people's um, mental health. So that, that's one of the things. We have some understanding of how some of the drugs that doctors use to help people with mental health problems work, but not very good. And we haven't had a new drug in the mental health area for a long time, yet you hear about a new cancer drug every day, you know, not every day, but, Mm. you know, almost every week. So we need to get better at understanding the sort of basic science part of, of mental health. We need to get better at understanding the imaging. We use imaging and MRIs and CTs again for cardiovascular disease and cancer, but we don't understand their how to utilise them in in mental health. And then we need to understand um, the public health aspect. And John talked about that a lot, but understanding how we can, at a population level, help people to understand what to do when mental health problems arise, where to go for help, and what help is the best to supply. So that's a lot of questions, a lot of research, but the answers are there, there's no doubt. Mm. We're getting so much better at talking about it, aren't we? Is that translating into funding? I mean, how supportive are governments right now in putting money into mental health research? Oh, I suppose there's two ways of answering that. Steve will probably answer it from from a, a research recipient. I'll answer it from from that community connectivity. As you said, the mental health conversation is really, really strong. It's really, really powerful. Um, is it translating into funding? It's translating into sort of funding that's actually supporting um, connectivity and supporting crisis work. Um, is it supporting longer term needs? Well, there's not been really investment into that severe enduring consumer cohort for a long period of time. Um, but there is good funding streams that are actually coming into sort of that, that the suicide prevention work. Is there enough money? Well, every researcher will tell you there's never enough money. Mm. Every charity will ever will tell you there's never, there's never enough money. I don't think it's just the responsibility of our governments to actually fund um, our projects. We really should be looking at how we look, work in partnership to actually look at co-funding. Um, the community are really engaged in wanting to be part of driving that change. And it, the donation isn't just about a donation. It's actually about that whole journey and the impact you can actually have. Um, our aim from a foundation perspective is, you know, if you give us a dollar, we've got to learn look at how we get leverage, how we can actually multiply that. Um, and one dollar can actually multiply into a larger impact for people. Um, so really it's looking at where do you want to channel that funding stream. So the government have actually uh, had the, the Million Minds concept and that's really focused uh, on, on Indigenous um, and Aboriginal uh, mental health service, uh, younger people uh, and eating disorders. Um, we actually had a further piece of work done by Ernst Jung and they drilled into it even further for us and we asked them to actually explore well, what's the strength here in, in South Australia because we've got some incredible universities and some mm. incredible researchers but the funding streams don't always channel into our state. So how do we actually look 
investing in our state to actually then start to show our brothers across the eastern seaboard that we're equally as good in that research arena. So Ernst Young really identified, well, if again, the, the eating disorders is very strong here. We've got incredible researchers. I mean, we've got one of the sort of uh, international leads in Professor Tracy Wade mm. at Flinders University. Why wouldn't you want to get behind her and her team? Um, so that's really strong. Um, we've got Indigenous health as well and Indigenous mental health. We've got uh, Professor Alex Brown over at um, Samri. Uh, and Alex is, is one of the, the sort of uh, academic leads uh, in, in Indigenous health and is wanting to explore, well, what does that really mean as a strategy for, for mental health? Um, then you've got through, through then to younger people. And the younger people continuum is, is immense. And so can you actually look at different targeted approaches from there? So we have been looking at funding in relation to suicide work for, for younger people, but also then looking at that very early conversation and you know when is it too young to start to have the mental health conversation and my answer to that would be it's, you're never too young to have it you know if we normalize that and actually look at clearer pathways early on then people will be able to talk about their mental health challenges as an everyday conversation like we do about our headache about our sport about our weather about where we're going on holiday mm. so that younger people com component also is really really important for us so we've got incredible research there and then through to sort of depression as some of the researchers are um, uh, Dr. Mike Musker over at uh, summary and um, they're really looking you know as one of the points that, that uh, Steve mentioned was, was how do we know what medication works well how do we know that if you were to instead of actually then saying you know well I'll try you on this I'll try you on this I'll try on this what happens if we could actually work out well how are each person the genetics sitting there how do we know what um, medication we absorb effectively how do we know which uh, sort of touch point we should be aiming for and would it be incredible if we get to the same cancer journey where we can get individual treatment plans for people with mental health issues just like we do for our cancer treatments mm. so i think those areas are really exciting areas of focus and uh, from a, a breakthrough perspective you know that's where we're looking at our funding streams so but it's got to be done in partnerships so it's not just down to a government if we can partner with the government even partner with philanthropic organizations you can partner with corporate world then all of a sudden that one dollar's become a lot bigger. Mm. Steve, you're a busy man, a very busy man. Why is it um, that you agreed to, to get on board and on the board of Breakthrough? Well, I, I think it goes back to what I said previously. I think, I think this is one of the unmet needs in medical research. I think we have medical research has performed extraordinarily well across the world and particularly in Australia. But this is an area where I feel we have not delivered. We've not delivered the evidence um, that we need to optimise treatment we haven't delivered the evidence for precision mental health care, and we don't have enough people working in the area. I always think of research in terms of people and platforms. By platforms, I mean buildings and MRIs and proton therapy units and all those exciting flashy machines, but you need the people. And if we look at mental health research, I don't think we've got enough people working on these problems, and we need to attract the best and the brightest to um, deal with these incredibly difficult questions. And uh, and I think that's where the funding needs to go. We, the NHMRC and the Medical Research Future Fund have addressed some of the funding gaps, but there are more funding gaps. And the biggest ones are supporting people on a career in mental health research. So they have the confidence to enter the area and then stay in the area and deliver. Because this is a long road. We're not going to get answers in six months or a year. We, we need outstanding minds working on this problem for five, 10 years to come up with the solutions in the same way as, you know, we developed vaccines for infectious diseases or drugs for cardiovascular disease. Mm. And on the end of that, do we dare to dream that this research could create a life free from mental illness? Uh, I, I think we just need to look at health and medical research and what it's achieved and where we are now compared to, say, 50 years ago. And we have eradicated diseases. There's a whole lot of conditions that really don't bother us anymore. And then a whole lot of conditions that people just aren't dying from anymore. And we can do the same with mental health. It just requires focus, requires funding and people and really good people concentrating on understanding um, the issues and then providing solutions. And then the other important part, obviously, and this is something that I believe SAMRI does extraordinarily well, is translating those findings into healthcare. So we often can be criticised for in the in medical research for, for doing great work, but not taking it into care. And um, so we absolutely need to make sure we implement our findings. So we do need those public health responses. So when we've worked out a particular tool or a particular app or a particular process that can help people, 
we've got to do the hard work and make sure that's available to everyone. Um, because the article in a highly rated journal doesn't help anyone. Mm. It's actually the findings in that article that we implement in a clinic or we implement in a public health response or an app that people can get on their phone. Mm. John, you'd agree with that? Oh, definitely. I mean, I think um, when we came up with the, the sort of the visions, people said to us, that's very bold. Um, and my argument to that was the fact that, well, we don't accept that people will die of cancer. We don't accept that people will die of cardiovascular disease or diabetes, etc. Yet we accept eight Australians that die of suicide today. And we accept that, you know, one in five people will experience a mental health challenge. And why is that? And isn't that just in itself discriminatory? Mm -hmm. And so we wanted to challenge that because, you know, I'm sure 20 years ago when someone said, oh, you know, we'll have individual treatments for, for cancer, people thought that's a ridiculous idea. Yet we've actually got laboratories actually growing 3D cancer cells with individual treatments and that's actually taking place for people. So why shouldn't we actually set that as a goal for mental health? Why is it acceptable that we've got these challenges? And it's not. So it would be incredible in 20 years' time if you to ask that same question and me and Steve obviously come out of retirement by then <laughs> um, to actually say, well, look what happens. Look at, you know, we've actually got people getting targeted interventions early. We've got schools that are actually having the mental health conversation as part of their curriculum. We've got people who are not feeling scared or worried about putting their hand up and asking for help because they're able now to do it and they're getting that support that should be there. And it's an everyday conversation and that would be incredible. Mm, wouldn't it? For those people listening um, who don't know a lot about the Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation. John, can you just give us a bit of bit of an outline of a timeline and, you know, what we're hoping to achieve in that time? Right, yeah. Um, we're a very young foundation in comparison to, obviously, some of our mental health partners. Um, we've only been uh, operational for the last two and a half years. Um, we are supported by the Flinders Foundation. That's where we sort of started from, and uh, we've now been uh, given permission to actually grow, um, which, which is really, really exciting. Um, if you're then looking about well, what are we wanting to do, well, we're actually wanting to invest in to the best research. We wanted to ask some of those difficult questions that often aren't asked, um, and we wanted to get evidence to prove why you should make this change, why you should put this intervention in place, why it should translate into policy and practice. Um, to do that, though, we have to do that in partnership. We've, you know, If we don't raise any funds, we don't raise dollars, we don't get conversations going, we don't get partnerships going, then these can be the best intentions and nothing will ever alter or change. But we're already starting to see that change. Um, if we look at from from breakthrough for this year, we're, we'll be investing you know f um, over four hundred eighty thousand um, dollars into um, grants across each of the three universities here in South Australia, um, and on top of that, then we've got further investment into some clinical translation interventions. So it's about eight hundred thousand in total. Well, that's not bad for a very small <laughs> charity just starting in that arena. Imagine then if we could actually join up with other foundations and said, well, what happens if we've got our eight hundred thousand and you've got your eight hundred and you've got your eight hundred? All of a sudden, we're actually putting money behind those great researchers. We're wanting to look at doing a structured approach. So we're wanting to look at different ideas. So what's that seed funding that, that can actually support someone that's saying, here's the stone, I want to look underneath it. What happens then when that stone's turned over and we know there's something really worth exploring, that's that PhD type concept that you actually want to put further research into it. And then what happens when that PhD actually finds is a really incredible intervention if we could actually upscale this and have that bigger impact, um, you know, looking at that fellowship and, and looking at that longer term intervention, you've got this three-stepped approach. And that's what we're wanting to actually look at in, in our funding streams, really, so we can actually then get behind that researcher. Because this could be a five-year journey, it could be a 10-year journey, but if it's actually worth having, then it's worth having, but you've got to invest behind it. And um, so from our perspective, you know, we, we are looking at really, really good research. We, we're going to be uh, launching some some new seed funded uh, outcomes uh, with Flinders University later this week. We've got um, new research that's going to be supported over at Adelaide University and uh, UniSA. And we're also now having conversations with Professor Ian Hickey over in Sydney to actually look at what can actually take place in the younger people's arena there as well. So we're wanting to get behind the best researchers. We wanting to get behind our own state but we also want to get those partnerships taking place across different universities and I think that's a role that um, Breakthrough can have. We can act to this umbrella bringing people together for that one outcome. Mm. Wouldn't that be incredible if we actually drive that change? Certainly would. Steve, on the research front, is there enormous interest from researchers in mental health or um, do they prefer to look into the traditional, you know, curing cancer and those sort of things? I, I think... Um I think your question indicates that probably in the past, researchers haven't wanted necessarily to mm. pick mental health as their area um, and have chosen the more 
you know, almost sexy areas of cancer and cardiovascular disease. Mm. I know that sounds funny, but that's um, that's the way researchers have been thinking. I think we're now seeing a group of younger researchers moving into mental health, and I think it's partly because the conversation's been more open, that sport sporting identities are talking about it, politicians are talking about it, our own health minister's talking about it. So people are, are acknowledging the issue, willing to talk about it, and that motivates um, young students to go into that area. Um, but we do have to do more. Uh, we do have to encourage them to go into the area. We have to attract the very brightest to be in the area. And um, and we are certainly trying to do that. And I am seeing I th- at SAMRI some of our best people wanting to work on these problems. So that, that's very exciting for us. It sure is. Throughout this series, we're going to be talking to a number of really brave people who are telling their own personal stories. This series really is a series of hope, isn't it? Oh, yeah, in- incredibly. I think um, the, the whole focus of what we're trying to do is that even at a time when you may feel you're on your own, that you may feel you're isolated, you may feel disconnected and no one's out there for you, there are people there. We just need to make that journey of how you can actually connect them a lot easier, and that's often a battle for us. Our, our, our present services and systems are set up in that, um, I think someone politely described it as, our systems are set up to put the ambulance at the bottom of the cliff, and we've not got the fence at the top. You know, imagine if the fence were at the top, and when you went to the fence, there was someone there to welcome you, uh, and made it easier. That would have a, a great outcome. So. The amount of people who are going to be joining us on the podcast, sharing their own personal short stories, and some of them are very complex stories. Some of them are, are, have, you know, there's high levels of emotion actually attached to it. Um, that's really, really powerful because what it does, it drives the conversation. It actually drives a change. It actually normalizes it. It breaks down some of those barriers and those blocks. And it lets people realize, I'm like that. That's me. But if you then connect with that's me, and then you listen to a researcher saying, I want to do something about that. That in itself just spreads that whole point about hope, doesn't it? And, and everything we want to do with, with any part of research is to give people that hope that something can drive a change, something will be different, and someone will be there for me. Um, so I think, yeah, hope, hope is a beautiful word, especially in the mental health arena. John Banyan, Professor Steve Wessling, thank you for your time. Thanks very much, thank Jess. You. Thank you for joining us as we share these extremely personal and important stories. If you would like to donate to Breakthrough Mental Health Research Foundation, please visit breakthroughfoundation.org.au. If anything spoken about in today's episode has been distressing for you, please contact Mental Health Emergency on 131465. We will have other resources in our show notes. Thank you for joining us. I'm Jess Adamson, and let's all tackle mental health head on.